Bueno, muy buenas tardes. Para nosotros es un gran placer dar inicio a este ciclo de conferencias que denominamos El Cuento con las Aves. Les agradecemos a todos haber atendido la, la convocatoria a esta, primera, a esta primera charla y queremos recordarles que quedan otras tres charlas muy interesantes. La próxima la tendremos con, con el doctor Richard Prum de la Universidad de Yale. Él nos va a hablar de la evolución de la belleza de las aves. Luego vamos a tener al profesor Daniel Cadena de la Universidad de los Andes. Él va a tratar de explicar un poquito el porqué de la altísima diversidad de aves en Colombia. Y finalmente vamos a, a tener al, al guía David Ascanio. Él es un guía experto en aves que nos va pues, a, a deleitar con las maravillas de los, de los tepuis del mundo perdido. Este ciclo de conferencias es posible gracias al gusto compartido por tres instituciones, la Universidad de AFIT, la Sociedad Antioqueña de Ornitología y Colombia Birding. Queremos agradecer de manera muy especial a la rectoría de la universidad, al Centro de Desarrollo eh, Cultural y al Grupo de Observadores de Aves de AFIT, porque pues, abrieron las puertas para que realizáramos este ciclo y nos permitieron, pues nos facilitaron las instalaciones para desarrollarlo y para atraer a los conferencistas desde afuera. Estamos muy agradecidos por, por, esta, por, estas, eh, por estas facilidades que nos han brindado y por el interés, ¿cierto? Mm, por su parte, pues la Sociedad Antioqueña de Ornitología está cumpliendo 28 años, entonces quería celebrar sus casi 30 años de existencia con este evento. Y finalmente, pues Colombia Birding se encargará de sacar a pajarear a nuestros conferencistas y nos ayuda hoy, nos colabora hoy con la traducción. Entonces agradecemos a Colombia Birding también por este apoyo. Y bueno, hoy tenemos el placer de abrir este ciclo con la doctora Carla Dove. Ella es bióloga de vida silvestre y está vinculada al Instituto de Smithsonian desde 1800, de, perdón, desde 1989. No, es, está más joven, está muy joven. Carla tiene una maestría en sistemática, evolución y biología de poblaciones y realizó su doctorado en ciencias ambientales y política pública. Actualmente Carla es la directora del Laboratorio de Identificación de Plumas del Museo de Historia Natural del Instituto Smithsonian. Carla ha sido consultora del Servicio de Pesca y Vida Silvestre de los Estados Unidos, de la Fuerza Aérea Estadounidense y de otras entidades públicas, así como de varias constructoras de motores aeronáuticos, entre otras empresas privadas. Las aplicaciones del campo de la identificación de plumas, como lo verán en esta, en esta charla, van desde la seguridad aeronáutica hasta la conservación, la antropología y la paleontología, pasando también por intríngulis del FBI y por el diseño de nuevos motores aeronáuticos. Esperamos disponer de un tiempo para preguntas, les rogamos silenciar sus celulares, ojalá pues, los apagaran para que estemos todos más tranquilitos y bueno ya, damos la bienvenida a Carla. Welcome Carla. We are very happy to have you here and please. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to Colombia. This is my first trip to South America and I'm just honored to say I'm happy to come to the best place first. <laughs> um, I apologize because I do not speak Spanish yet. I'm learning and I want to learn more, but um, tonight we are going to be hearing the translation from Diego, who is back up in the cabin. And so any mistakes or uh, misspeaking is not my fault, it's Diego. <laughs> If I go too fast, somebody put your hand up and wave at me and I will slow down. Uh, if you don't understand something I'm saying, ask Diego. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you tonight about a very special field within ornithology, which we are now calling forensic ornithology. And it's basically uh, the way that we use a variety of scientific methods to identify birds, and not based on the whole bird, and not based on what we traditionally think of as ways to identify birds, but microscopic evidence and feather fragments and bits and pieces of birds that we can use to help us identify and, and tell us what kind of birds it is that we are looking at. This technique is mainly used to identify bird strikes. And so what we do is we take all of the birds that we know and love up here at the top 
and we try to identify what hits the birds that we use to get around with uh, and we depend on to travel there on the bottom. So if you look at the beauty and diversity of birds, um, you can see some very beautiful examples in nature. And there are about 10,000 species of birds and all of them are different from each other. And basically this is because of their plumages. This is the way we see birds based on their feathers and, and what they look like. So feathers have a variety of functions and some of the functions are for camouflage, some of them are for insulation to help keep the bird warm. Uh, the, the functions also are for mate attraction and defense and sound. Some birds have very specialized feathers that help them make noises and I think Rick Prum will talk to you more about that when he gives his presentation. Uh, some recent studies involve feather de degradation and bacteria and also how feathers protect birds from uh, con contaminants and environmental diseases. If you look at the diversity of single feathers, you will notice that, of course, there's a lot of beauty here, too. There's different colors and textures and different types of feathers. Depending on where the feather comes from on the bird's body, it could also look different. And if you think about it, if you look at one bird, you can see multiple different feather, feather patterns and feather types on one species. So the, the yellow fe feather on the left the polka dotted feather in the middle and then the spotted feather all the way over on the right all come from a yellow shafted flicker. If you look at something like a ruffed grouse, you will notice that the tail is very different from the feathers on the rest of the body. American kestrel has a very unique tail feather, but doesn't look at all like the feather that you might find if you pull just a single feather off of the breast. A blue jay is all blue, but there's different kinds of patterns. So you'll see a solid blue feather as opposed to one with a barring on it. So when you look at all of this variation in single feathers from different birds, you might wonder how in the world would you go about identifying birds from single feathers. And that's where the microscopic structure of the feather comes in handy. So if you look at a whole feather, like this illustration here, it's basically divided into two parts. The top of the feather is called the pinaceous part, and the bottom part of the feather that's fluffy and fuzzy is the plumulaceous part. This is the part of the feather that has the diagnostic microscopic characters that help us identify groups of birds. If you look at this with a scanning electron microscope, the pinaceous part of the feather is the part of the feather that has the hooklets. This is the part that lets the bird zip its feather together and make a nice airfoil. So each little hooklet will lap over the next barb next to it and form the pinaceous feather. This is a classic textbook image that you see in ornithological textbooks. The part of the feather that has the diagnostic characters and helps us identify the bird is this part. So if you look at the downy barbules and the characters within that part of the feather, they look very different from the top uh, of the feather. This is another way to look at it. Both types of feathers are composed of barbs and barbules. So the barb of the pinaceous feather is composed of the barb and the barbules and they have the hooklets on the barbules and the nodes are the little hooklets so they all interlock. If you look at the downy part or the plumulaceous part, you have a barb, you have the barbule, and the barbules have these little nodes that are telescoping and connected to each other, and they have the different shapes and structures. So the nodes are the important part in the microscopic analysis. This is the smallest division of the feather. This is where all of the variation occurs in these groups of birds. One more look, <laughs> just so you know where we are. If you take a feather, you pluck one downy barb, kind of looks like this, and then you take one barbule and enlarge it, and it looks like a long string of maybe like pearls on a, str on a string. The person who really pioneered this whole science is named Roxy Laybourne, and Roxy was my mentor at the Smithsonian. I studied with her for about 13 years. Um, she started working on feather identification 
back in 1960. She started working at the Smithsonian in 1944. And she's really the pioneer of forensic ornithology. She's the one who sat down and looked at all of these characters and tried to figure out what characters were unique to certain orders of birds. So what Roxy did was look at the orders of birds. And she determined that if you look at the microstructure of the turkeys and the quails and the chickens, you're going to see something that looks like this. Long barbules with very diagnostic ring-shaped structures. Ducks, on the other hand, a completely different order, have short barbules with triangular shaped nodes at the tips. So these two groups of birds have very different microscopic structures. And Roxy set about describing these differences. Some of the things that she taught us to look for include the type of nodal structure that you see on these microscopic characters. Some of them, as I showed you, are rings or triangle shapes. Some groups of birds have star-like shapes. Some have a prenodal swelling. Some actually have prongs, and some have spines. There's a very important character called villi that will diagnose certain groups of birds. Another thing to look at is where is the pigment on these barbules? Is it right at the node? Is it stippled internodally? Is it prenodal, or is it after the node? And finally, where are these nodes located on these barbules? Are they all along the barbule? Are they just at the tip? Or are they only at the base? And do some birds have nodal uh, locations of nodes at different, on different parts of the barbule? And so these are some of the characters that Roxy had figured out that we need to look at to identify groups of birds. I just want to run through a couple examples of some of the microscopic differences to give you an idea of how different orders of birds can be. So if we talk about the falconiforms, which includes the eagles and the hawks, we see downy barbules that are very long, they have spines at the nodes, and they have pigment internodally. There's no pigment at the node on the birds of prey. If you look at strigiforms, which include the owls, they also have long barbules, but they have pigment at the nodes, and they have expanded nodes at the base, and they have these long barbules with very elongated pigment and nodes at the tip. So it's very unique for that order of birds. Anseriformes include the ducks, geese, and swans. I already showed you a couple examples of this. This is a scanning electron microscope image. This is a light image, a light microscope image. And so with the light microscope, we can see the pigment. With the scanning, we can't. But with the scanning image, you can see the three-dimensional shape of these nodes. And so you kind of get an idea here of what a diving or a dabbling duck might look like with the triangular shaped nodes at the tip. And then this is the way those nodes look in three dimension. Columbiforms include the doves. <laughs> and this is the way the downy barbules look on the doves and pigeons. They have these nice flower-shaped nodes and very long barbules. Again, this is a scanning electron image. The chicken and the turkeys and the, and the pheasants and the quail have a very diagnostic ring. There's only one other group of birds that have this ring, and those are the tinamous. Now, we all know that tinamous are not supposed to be closely related to chickens. Go figure. Sometimes there are convergences. Or maybe they really are related to chickens. Um, the passeriformes, or the perching birds, are diagnostic in that they have long barbules with a lot of, of nodes that are pigmented along the barbule. And they have a lot of villi. I don't know if you remember, but I pointed that character out earlier. Villi are these little knob-shaped projections at the base cell. And that is diagnostic mainly to passerines, but a few other groups um, have those too. Diego actually worked with us on uh, this character on a, a speci uh, specific bird a few years ago. Another angle or another view of the villi, they have knobs, little knobs on them. This is a, a scanning electron image of a horned lark, just to show an example of where this villi is. It's a very specific location on the little downy barbules. Woodpeckers have villi, but woodpeckers have a different shaped villi. There's turn backwards. So if we just have one tiny little piece of a fluffy feather and we see, it, we see this character and it's turned backwards, 
we know it's a woodpecker. So what we decided to do was try to quantify some of these characters that Roxy had described and written down to see if there really were quantifiable or measurable differences in these birds. And so again, we're looking, looking at the barb, barbule, and the node. We did a lot of measurements.